University Action Plan. Implementation as we take beginning steps to make DEI a priority in Monroe County. The DEI department will be working with their department heads and DEI leaders to help implement diverse, equitable, and inclusive methods throughout every department in Monroe County. So I'm getting ready to launch the poll now. One second here. Just a quick little three questions, just so we are aware. Let's see. So that should be posted for everybody if you take a moment there. So, and then regarding the Monroe County Culture Committee, so there is a question on there about that. Now, if you are interested, we do meet that, I wanna say the first Wednesday of every month. If you are interested in that, it does not matter what your title is. It is open invite for anybody, as long as you work for Monroe County. And for more information on that, you can also email us at the mcdei at monroecounty.gov email. And I can send you the information that way. And then if you have any questions regarding anything that I went over as far as the reminders, anything on this page, please be free to give me again. My name in the chat is Coleman Faison. You can message me in the chat or just email me later. I'll make sure I answer those for you. And at this point, whenever Dr. Kimbrough is ready, I'll go ahead and turn it over to her. All right, thank you so much, Coleman, um, for those updates. As you guys can see, these are just some of the results of the poll and we'll be following up based on uh, these results. So again, thank you so much for being here today and participating in this wonderful event. Um, it's gonna be a great discussion today. We really have some trailblazers in our community today sharing with us their stories and their insights around the lines of uh, what it means to be a woman, a woman as well as intersectionalities that are attached to that. Okay. All right. So these are our, our panelists. We have Rhonda Walker, and we'll go through and do a, a little bit more of a formal introduction to each of our participants as well. But we also have Erica Mock, Sadie El Elevardo Fisher. Please, please forgive me if, if I mess up any of your names, and please feel free to correct me, as well as Jean Sharba. Jean, please tell me. Please say your last name for me. I don't want to mess it up. All right, strap in. Straza Bosco. Straza Bosco. Straza Bosco. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here with us today and a little bit more about our panelists. Okay, so Rhonda is, uh, it was born in Guyana, South America, and she has always had the desire to help families overcome personal challenges. She has worked for over 17 years as a community-based um, organizer and has also uh, worked to identify trauma uh, with trauma and address generational curses. She is also a part of the medical missionary program of the Seventh-day Evangelist Church. And she is also a member of the Guyana United Youth Development Association. Rhonda, thank you so much for being here with us today. Okay, Erica, she serves as the co-chair of the Racial Equity Initiative with Enrico Forme School. Um, again, I'm sorry, guys, if I, if I say it wrong, please feel free to correct me. Uh, Erica has also helped to develop and realize the public service announcement with our local CBS affiliate in Rochester that recognizes and raises public awareness for the Frederick Douglass Initiative, also known as FDFI. Erica has also worked with administrators, teachers, and others at the Anna Murray Douglas Academy to develop a Douglas Descendants Legacy Curriculum. She also spearheads the Anna Murray and Annie Douglas Historical Memorial Project. Uh, Erica has played a key role as the FDFI as an FDFI board member with others in planning for the Frederick Douglass Museum and Center for Equality, Justice, and Knowledge. Erica, thank you so much for being with us today. Okay, Sadie joins us as an award-winning queer, queer feminist 
Latina speaker and known for her energy and passion around social justice. In 2019 and 20, she was profiled in the Diversities Journal for, diversities, for the Diversity Leader Award. In 2001, she was one of 200 women featured in the Change Makers exhibit at the Rochester Museum and Science Center. She was also a contributor in the 2021 Latinx, Latinx Agenda. And some of her roles include the commissioner, a commissioner on the race committee, as well as a board member of the Greater Rochester Health Foundation, a member of the Latino Leadership Development Executive Steering Committee. And when she is not doing all the great work that she does, she loves to spend time with her wife and three children as they are her motivation. I think we have someone with their, their hand raised that might have a question. Coleman, do you see someone with the hand raised? Maybe they tapped it by accident because I can't not seeing anything right now. Can't I don't see it here. Okay, maybe that was an accident. All right, thank you so much, Sadie, for being with us today. Okay, Jean, thank you so much for being with, with us today. Jean has created and implemented staff development around diversity, equity, and inclusion for the Pittsburgh District staff, including implicit bias, LGBTQ safe zone training, as well as introversion in the classroom. She has also worked with the YMCA of Greater Rochester, Camp Corey, that connected the Pittsburgh urban suburban students with the beauty and benefit of summer camp. She has also launched and coordinated the Kicks for Campers Kickball Tournament and Camper Scholarship Fundraiser, as well as acted as a volunteer with the YMCA Empowering Young Women of Color. Currently, Jean coordinates in this moment, Revolution Reckoning, Rec Reckoning Reparation, which is a book that lead, that which elevates and celebrates the revolutionary work, stories, and images of the local Black leaders, essayists, and artists. Jean, thank you so much for being here with us today. All righty, tidy. All right, guys, so we want to get into our discussion um, and have our conversation over some of the barriers that these women have experienced as they have been in the working world, working in the community, and just really doing the work that they love. As we know, women experience many barriers, such as a lack of equal pay, discrimination because of our caretaker statuses, devalued and overlooked for leadership roles, as well as the daily microaggressions. I mean, this is something that is not only historical to what it means to be a woman in our society, but something we see every day. Even when we think about um, the, the, the um, confirmation of Judge Brown Jackson, we can see these things playing out in real life for us and, and it is televised what it what it means to be a woman and have biases and be undervalued for some of your accomplishments. And these are things that many of us have experienced um, because we are a woman, but also because we are women, but also some of the intersectionalities and different diverse dimensions of diversity that are attached to that. All right, so let's get started with our first question. Now, I'll just go ahead and ask these questions and you guys can feel free to, you know, make sure you are unmuted and, and uh, you know, just throw in your, your thoughts and your insights. Please feel free to share your stories um, and, and provide us with any information that you would like. So the first question is, describe your identity as a woman in, in the workforce today. And anyone can go, don't be shy. I'll jump in. Um, I think of myself as a storyteller. And, and I wanna thank you for these questions. The questions were great. You know, they say that your life flashes before you and moments before you, 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 know, you die or in an accident, but my life flashed before me from these five questions. And I liked what I saw, I really did. But the common thread and it continues today is a storyteller. Um, and one of the things I've learned is I need to be where the stories are at. <laughs> I know that's not grammatically correct, but be where the stories are. And, um, and, some, and oftentimes that means, 
you, you know, uh, leaving where I tend to hang out, all right? So getting into some new places. And um, one of my other identities continues to be a student. I just love, um, I love to learn. Uh, another identity I carry is a high introvert. So um, I just like to get that out there because as a high introvert, there's probably a few of you out there. There's, chances are a good 25% of the folks with us today are introverts. So I, I happen to be a high introvert and I, that, that's always with me. I wish I could leave it, but it's always with me. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with me. It just means I have to take care of myself um, before and after a, a, a you know an experience like this, which is so wonderful. But it will it will work. The, the adrenaline will cause me uh, cause me some damage. Um, but I will take care of it. Don't worry. And I think that's it. Those are my identities. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing those, Jean. And I would really like to emphasize what you said about being a continuous learner. And I think as we learn about our identity, because these are things that we start to learn, to learn about ourselves over time, which is evolving, right? We are consistently learning about ourselves, who we are, what that means in society, and then, and then how it in turn relates to uh, any particular powers we have, any particular privileges that we have or lack thereof. So thank you so much for sharing that. Okay, Erica, would you like to share with us? Hello, everybody. Thank you for, for having me on today too. Um, it's always exciting when I can be a part of something where women are supporting each other. So that's just always something that's that I seek out. So I'm, I'm just really privileged to be here with you guys today. Um, I think that my identity um, is a multitude of things because of my experiences. So I think um, particularly, you know, um, if we're looking from an exterior perspective, I'm a woman of a color. What of what is that, right? Um, what does that mean? Because that is topic of conversation um, in, in my world um, often. Um, and it's used, I think, in a way to justify whether I belong here or not sometimes. So I'm met with the challenge of um, having to use the tone of melanin in my skin to justify why I know what I know or why I am sitting in the seat that I'm sitting in. And, um, and you know, that is not something that when I wake up, I think about every single day, um, but I remain the same with everyone, no matter who that is, so that you take the, the, the Michelle Obama approach, be the same with everyone, so that there is never a misconception of who you are, and, and if there's an irrepresentation of that, then people know what it is. So I really feel like I'm a truth teller, I'm a fact finder, um, I run my life parallel to the truth. Um, and certainly an agitator. And I think that um, that is why I find myself in the, in the role that I'm in now. Um, but I'm also a mother, um, I'm a grandmother. And I think that it's important for me to be able to um, set the tone that even though I only have sons and grandsons, but it's important for me to set the tone as a human being um, and teaching people how to treat me is, is, is another part of, um, I think, um, what can be part of my identity is just is just being real as much as possible. Very nice, very nice, Erica, I love that. And you said something about belonging and how people determine your belonging because of the color of your skin, because of your gender and, and all the different dimensions that exist. And that is something that we are working towards every single day as a department of DE&I is to create a place where people feel as though they belong despite some of their marginalizations or you know what society has told us being a woman of color, you may not belong in a leadership role. So those are some of the, the stereotypes and some of the biases that we are looking to overcome. So thank you so much for shedding light on that. Okay, Sadie. I love hearing what Jean and Erica had to say. And, um, oh, Sadie, we yeah. can't hear you. Oh no. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's better. Okay. All right, I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> um, so in terms of um, who I am, so I thought about in my bio, right? I always put in my bio some of my identities and because I think there's just such important components of not only who I am, um, how I see the world, the perspectives I bring to the table, but I also, I went through a lot to be able to claim and own and like 
love those various pieces of who I am, right? And I and so I want to, you know, just kind of share that, that it wasn't always a time where I understood what it meant to be identify as a queer woman, right? And to be able to say that in spaces and own that in spaces. And so that's a really um, important for me to be able to own all of those various identities that you heard of before. Um, but in addition to all those other identities, I'd like to think of myself as a disruptor, right? disrupting the status quo and bringing things um, you know, to light, if you will, and having conversations that are important. I'm a survivor um, of a lot of various different things. And I think many of us that are here today have survived something or multiple some things to get to where we are today. Uh, and then also a lover, um, love of community, love of people, love of who, you know, like just the the stories that I hear from people on a regular basis. And I think that's an important piece too that I bring with me in terms of in this world that what is the point of fighting and disrupting and agitating and doing all the great work that we do if you don't love what you do and love the people you're doing it for and the change you wanna see. Um, so I would say those are big components of um, who I am in this um, world today. And then all the other identities, being a proud mom, right, being a wife, being someone who really just loves, you know, community and wanting to see. Ultimately, I want the world to be better and the spaces where I can influence to be better than where how I found it at my end of days. When I look back, Jean, at my legacy and what I've left behind, I want to know that in some ways I've made a positive impact and made a difference. Wonderful. Thank you so much for saying that, Sadie. And what you mentioned that really stood out to me is about loving, loving who you are and all the dimensions that come with you. And I know in society will tell us that this is not, this is you know not okay, or this is not good enough, or this is not who you should be, but identifying who you are and then standing in that is so powerful. So thank you so much, Sadie, for that. Okay, Rhonda. I like to say, Wellness, winning Wednesday, and of course today I'm going to say Women's Wednesday as well. So all the W's fall into place. <laughs> and you know, I was reading and looking at the questions, and it caused me to pause because I had never reflected on myself in that way. Sad to say. And so I'm like, oh, okay, who am I? And so I would like to say that I am beautiful. And when I say that, it's because I'm usually walking around saying beautiful as in be you, be the full you. And one of the things that my mom always said to me was beauty lies on the inside. And so I, I really grew up looking for the beauty of people on the inside and didn't realize what I, how that was showing up. And so growing up in Guyana, where I really saw everyone looking like me. Teachers, doctors, lawyers, you know, I felt like I belong, felt connected. So I'm a, a sister, I love to engage, I love life, and I love looking for beauty in everyone. And so I think coming to America, that changed. And it changed in that I left a place from feeling belong, knowing who I am, feeling connected, to coming to a place where people would say, well, who are you? The, if I say, hi, where are you from? And then seeing people that look like me and realizing we were skin colored, connected, but there was something that was missing. And they were like, well, you're not from here. So my identity was coming and it, and it sounds as though it was moving because I felt as though I knew where and who I was in the beginning and that changed. And so showing up in this world, it also followed me. And I still, I love people. I am a mother and being a mother taught me that really beauty comes from the inside and it shows up and just really seeing how you can pour into others and pour into. And, and so those are some of the things that really beautiful and genuine, positive most of the time, loving life, full of energy, love that wellness, healing, wanting to connect with others and also wanting others to know that whatever it is that you have, it's within you. So, and, and those are some of the things that identifies me, just that I see you and I'm always looking for that beauty in others. And sometimes 
it has caused me some serious stress because as I'm looking for that beauty and I'm connecting and I heard that Jean said that and I didn't even know it was a thing where you feel people's energy and you don't know where it was and and where it came from and you, it shifts you and you're wondering internalizing all of that all of that makes me unique and beautifully who I am and I see it in others as well. Absolutely. Wonderful, Rhonda. Thank you so much for sharing. And I just want to point out something that you said about when you transition from Ghana, Guyana and came to the Americas, the difference that it was, right? And that sense of belonging and what identity means. So it's very important for us to think about identity. So we have our identity with our family, right? But when we start to get out into the world, society tells us what it means to be who we are, what it means to be women, what it means to be a woman of color, what it means to be a woman of the LGBTQ status, what it means to be a woman of a, of a, um, a, a immigrant woman, all those things mean something different. So although we are all women, but there's those intersectionalities and those, those are many. We talk about our caretaker statuses. We talk about being mothers. We talk about being wives and those different things. And all of those things are the intersectionalities that make our experiences different, that make, make our identities different and that makes our stories so very unique. So again, ladies, thanks for sharing that. So let's move on to the meat of the conversation and kind of hear some of your stories, um, you know, the things that you've encountered and the things that you've overcome as it relates to um, some of these barriers. Okay, next slide. Oh, back one. All right. Is, is this the next one? That's the back one more. Back it up, there we go. So what are some of the challenges you've had because of your identity? And this can be at work, this can be in society, you know, with, with friends, what have you, but just what are some of those stories? And, and anybody, again, feel free um, to start with, with your thoughts here. I can go next. I think some of the challenges that I've identified and, you know, I've seen is, feeling like I fit in, but then also how that shows up in, in, in the work world, especially being a nurturing person and being told that, you know, what you give is going to come back to you and being intentional and often giving. And in this world as a social worker, continually and consistently giving, giving, giving when I, you know, when I worked with families, giving, pouring into and then getting into leadership roles where I realized suddenly that something shifted. So I was able to pour into others, but when it was expected and when I expected the same to be given, it, I didn't receive it in that way. And, and some of that I felt that maybe because there was an assumption that this is someone that knows a lot and we can take and take and take, but she has to always give. And I think those are some of the challenges because as it questions, it allows you to question even some of your passions because as you're giving and giving and you're feeling empty and wanting someone to give back to you, I think sometimes that shifts and it causes you to pause and, and then you see the, what I would call sometimes hysteric, you know, hysterical trauma coming up and, mm -hmm. and being able to sit in rooms and at tables and see things from a different perspective and sharing it and wondering out loud and holding space for that. And oftentimes I say, sometimes my little girl came out and having to remind her that, and I call her Ronnie and say, Ronnie, we have the tools to speak up because I was told to use your voice and speak and speak the truth and speak it always. And I realized that that is something that, you know, it was a challenge. It is still a challenge, but just constantly and consistently reminding myself that whatever I do need and leaning back on the words that my mom say and when my belief, my spiritual belief is that whatever we need, it's in us. And I can lead because my leader leads with compassion 
and empathy and there's no putting down, there's not oppression. So when I'm leading, even though I'm seeing those challenges, I'm constantly reminded that I don't have to give what is given to me. I can rise above and that comes back to me. So those are some of the challenges that I've experienced. Thank you so much, Rhonda. Who can add on to that? Who, who would add on to that or have had some similar experiences? So, um, I'd like to just piggyback on so much um, that you were saying, but one of the things that really resonated to me is the that voice, right? Or going back to Ronnie, as you were saying, like the younger um, version in you, but you know, what I always try to do and say to folks is not only around like using, you know, your voice and remembering you have a voice, but also recognizing that we are enough. Um, and for me, in terms of challenges has been oftentimes, and, I, and I, I don't think I'm alone or have this as a unique experience, is that oftentimes we're made to feel like we are not enough, right? We have to do that much more, or we have to prove ourselves, or that oftentimes we have to work that much harder for people to see our worth and our value. And that can we can begin to internalize that, right? And because someone else doesn't see it, we start to begin to believe those things about ourselves. And so um, remembering that we are enough and when you add all these other identities to that, um, Dr. D, you were mentioning it earlier about, you know, just even others telling us who we need to be. And I think about diversity, not only um, between groups, but within groups. So even having all the incredible women on here, right? Like there's diversity amongst even this group. And sometimes, Others make us feel like, what does it mean to be Latina and what is, how do I need to be, and what does it mean to be Latina and not for, or to be part of the LGBT or be enough in that too. And within all of be woman enough, right? All of these kinds of things are even to be enough as a leader, et cetera. And so I think some of those challenges have been external factors mm -hmm. from the environment that sometimes tell us we're not enough. And then what's hard is when we begin to internalize that. And so some of those challenges become then us overcoming and saying, that is not me, I am enough, right? And how do you um, have those, and I know we're gonna get into that, but those circles around you to ensure that when those voices, external voices get so loud and as you're trying to talk to that internal voice, it's getting harder and harder that you have those other people in your life that can come to you and say, no. Like, girl, don't even <laughs> touch yourself for a single second. Um, and I'm fortunate to say I have a lot of those individuals in my life that can help me when I'm in those spaces of self-doubt and questioning my own self-worth because of some of those external factors. Mm, very nice. Very good, Sadie. Uh, I mean, I really like everything um, that you said um, and, and also the things that Rhonda has said as well. And I think it really takes courage to step out and say, Look, I'm. I don't have to meet your expectations. This is who I am, and and that's enough. Um, and I belong here. You know, different doing those things. Um, who can add on to that, or who would like to to provide their insights around this question? Oh, oh, go ahead, Jean. Um, I can add to that that feeling of not belonging. Um. You know, I, I feel like my career as a teacher, a French teacher, um, there's two phases. One where I was scared and I just didn't want anyone to find out I wasn't enough. And during that phase, I was, um, I really had a leader who, I had a supervisor who bullied me and harassed me. And, I, and she was skilled enough to, to know my underbelly. And my underbelly, one of my identities, in addition to be a woman, was um, a single woman, a, um, a single parent, rather, um, and then a divorced woman, and and during this terrible time, um, living the the I'm, Sadie. I want to thank you for mentioning your identity as a survivor, and and I um, as well am a survivor. And during that time, I really was just trying to stay off the radar, and I had no allies. I had no time to. Um, to, to gather the people around me because, you know, you're a single, I was a single mom and I'm working a weekend job. Sometimes I'm working evenings and, um, you know, trying to get care for my son. And, and I know that you can tell from my hair and maybe my wrinkles, you know, I, this was early eighties. And, and then the second half was, um, the identity was, 
I'm done. You know, no one's going to harm me anymore. And I became, um, I think, really the, a radical survivor. And then, I, you know, I flipped it on. Uh, well, <laughs> and interestingly enough, you probably wouldn't think that now, but during those those times of the transition from silence, get the job done and um, please everyone, the kids in the classroom, the leaders around you who are really not acting on your behalf. Um, uh, I was sexually harassed a couple of times. And, and then I was also bullied. And then I was also harassed by a student to the point where um, the student slapped me on my way out of the classroom one day. And I guess, I know you're probably like, what? She taught in Pittsburgh? Yes. Okay. So, um, and that, that really uh, helped me find my voice and it helped me find my voice and it helped me find what I needed to learn to bring my voice out and then to start looking around for those, those allies that the, the safe people, they're like, Gene, you aren't crazy. Um, yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you, Jean. I mean, that that was that was very, very powerful. And some of the things that you you said is that you were surviving. You were kind of on the outside, not using your voice, not wanting to be noticed. Um, and that can be harmful for ourselves to do that. That can create a level of psychological safety um, and, it, and it be an issue in the way that we work and our abilities to grow, which is a need that we have. That's our biological need is to grow, to be heard, to be included. So when we decide to survive, we are not meeting our biological needs. And therefore we are, we are creating an environment or we are participating in an environment that harms our, our psychological safety. So, you know, being able to step out of that is very, very commendable. Um, and I'm sure once you did that, as you said, you were able to start to thrive, right? So not until we can step out of those fears that we have that we in, and use our voice, we are able to actually thrive and have great experiences. And I know there's so many of us today that are just surviving, right? We're waiting to get to the end of the week. We're waiting till we get paid again to the next opportunity, what have you. But we there's so much more quality in life when we extend ourselves to, to actually thrive and, and give ourselves the permission, the permissions to do that. And, and you also talk about um, the imposter syndrome, right? So having a fear that people may find out that you are not enough, but you have the credentials and you got the job. So why wouldn't you be enough, right? And I think that's something that we've all experienced that somebody will find out even the most successful of people, of women um, have expressed uh, having this, this, this imposter syndrome is that I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not enough. And, and that goes to, as Mercedes was saying, fighting those, those battles of the status quo or what people that are here should look like, what they should be like. They shouldn't be a single mom or they shouldn't be that, you know, those different things um, and, and really having the courage to confront those, those different things. So thank you so much. Okay, Erica. Well, I can really uh, identify uh, very much with Eugene, and um, I, you know, can understand that. Um, for me, for example, some of the challenges that I've had because of my identity, I started out as a teenage mom, you know, and so I was a baby having a baby, and um, and boy, I had the world was my oyster. I was set up to study abroad in London, England. My grades were exceptional, and I had a lot of opportunities and. Um, and went to college half day in high school. But because of that, um, you know, set on a different path. And it was me and the baby against the world. Um, I had to figure it all out on my own. And um, even the challenges of just not even understanding how to take care of a child um, really on my own and finding myself in a position, not with just one, but a few years later, another child. And, you know, it was me and them against the world and, uh, and being homeless and the three of us um, on more than one occasion and having to really kind of keep focused on that and, and getting opportunities in front of me that could have really changed the trajectory of where I'm sitting at right now and wouldn't have been here um, because had I chosen the easier way 
because I needed to buy diapers or I had to have formula and I made just too much money um, to be on welfare or get WIC or get any of those subsidies that could help provide for my children, but yet I was still struggling to pay daycare. So you make a choice. And you know, knowing what that was like um, and where my children would have totally been set up for the pipeline from preschool to prison as young black men. But because I said, no, that no matter what the circumstances are, we're in this together and we're gonna figure it out together and it's gonna be hard and we're not gonna have, we're gonna have to go to the thrift store for your school clothes, but that's what it's gonna be, you know? And now, you know, I have two incredible sons who are thriving, doing well in their lives, um, have not ever been part of any system, um, you know, are, um, uh, go getters one is a great dad and husband and you know i did that <laughs> i did that i made them good human beings not good men but good human beings so you know that was a challenge that i had to not become statistics um and and you know i continue to fight that sometimes too um i'm not from here i'm not from rochester originally and just learning a new environment and learning new people, um, those pose their own challenges. Um, but again, I think what has been the most um, um, the most challenging is just making sure that I don't get deterred. That is probably my biggest current challenge is to make sure that I don't lose course, um, that my eye is on the prize, and that this is not about me. It is about the greater. It is about Ubuntu. And so that's, I think those are the, the, the constant, you know, repositioning for myself that I find, find myself in, but, um, but I think I'm built for it. So yeah. I'm sure Erica, I'm sure. And thank you so much for sharing. And, and I definitely can relate to you about being a single mother and all the, the biases that come along with that. Well, if you're a single mother, how can you get a college education? Or how, how did you become a, a doctor? It's like, I mean, that didn't limit my, my intellectual abilities. Yes, I had to work a whole lot harder, um, but that gave me all the more motivation, like you said, Erica, to continue to, to do the work and be the example um, and, and the, the, the role model for my children. So again, thank you so much for sharing that. Okay, next question. My timekeeper has told me that I need... <laughs> that, that I need to be uh, cognizant of the time. Thank you, timekeeper. Um, how have you overcome those challenges? And I think that you guys, if you have anything additional here to add, and I think that you guys kind of put those two in one um, with the last question on what your challenges are and how you have overcome those, but um, I'll leave it open now if there's anything additional you want to add here. No? Okay. All right, sounds good. All right, to the next question. Who are your key allies and advocates um, as you are overcoming? And I, and I think that this is very important because there are people that will show up in our life to be an ally and to be an advocate. And it's really, you know, it may be unexpected. It may be someone totally different. And those people that look like you, you may expect those people to be your allies and your advocates, but they are not sometimes, right? Sometimes for me, it could, it could be a white male in order to open a door for me to provide a different perspective for me. So I really would love to hear some of your stories around how you have found your allies and advocates and, and for some of the things that you have done. And just a point of uh, definition, an ally is someone who is promoting you um, and what you do in spaces where you may or may not have a voice. And someone that is your um, advocate is also someone doing the same thing. And you can think about these things almost like a mentor, but someone who is really pulling you through and putting you at the forefront of tables that you may not have a seat at, um, recommending you, placing you, speaking on your behalf and really being active um, in, in that promotion and uplifting of you. Okay. Who would like to start? I can okay. start. Oh. Oh. <laughs> not all at once ladies not all at once right <laughs> go ahead erica i'll just briefly say because i always feel like whenever i sit in on a zoom and if i have a picture of frederick douglas behind me i feel like he is um interrupting slightly <laughs> 
and in a good way, in a good way. But I feel like, you know, like occasionally my eyes will drift and it's like, he's looking at me like, he's like, remember to say that, remember that. Um, and I, 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 and as wild as this may sound, um, I really feel like my ally is actually myself um, because I wake up telling myself what I know I'm capable of doing and don't let that, um, you know, um, doubt to, to deter you, even though things aren't always as easy as said than done. But but I just try to continually remind myself of that, of being my own ally. Um, but then I think the advocate part of it would definitely be in a very spiritual way. Um, Frederick and Anna Marie Douglas. I must mention Anna because this is Women's History Month. And I had to move from Ohio all the way to Rochester to find my sister advocate. And I think that, you know, she um, she's she's my auntie, she's my advocate, she's my spiritual guide. Um, she talks to me, she is the lady of this house that I sit in right now. And I feel like those are the things that um, when I am finding difficulty in the things that are going on specifically in this community and in the country, I lend to people like that, like Frederick and like Anna, um, not because of my job. I've been part of this organization for over a decade um, and as the executive director for less than a year. So I feel though that I am brought here for a reason and I feel like I can be in turn her advocate and her spokesperson and her voice and that we can do this together. And when I go and I visit her grave and I talk to her and I talk to their daughter, Annie, I feel that kinship, that sisterhood, that mother, you know, that, that common ground as mothers and, and facing some challenges while I'll never understand exactly what she faced, but to a very small, small degree, um, I feel that presence and it is, um, it is un, un, unlike anything I've ever experienced, but I feel like I, I'm privileged that I get to, we get to be sisters in that voice of, of advocacy together. Nice. Thank you so much, Erica. And I would like to also say, I feel sometimes when I saw that question, I was like, wow, who? And, and I again pause because. I realized that I have not even considered and thought about it, but as I reflected, they have all been women. And I know that one of the things that I had one supervisor that whenever I would share my insecurities of not feeling that I can be a leader, how many times she would reflect. And, and, and I think one of the things that I learned is that that hard work, there's a consistency when we, and we talk about the rhythm of the heart and there's a consistency that happens when you're interacting with someone and you can be what I call your authentic self. Whenever I say that the ATH, you know, the TH people smile, but there's something about that. And I realized that there were specific supervisors. They are all supervisors that really, and they would pour into in a different way in reflecting some of the things. So whenever I shared my heart, they would reflect back and, and really share, you can do this. And, and there was a lot of self-doubt, especially just because oftentimes I say certain things, but it's I'm wondering about its impact. And those allies that I've had really reflected back to me that you know, when it's coming from the heart, the consistency, and when someone is consistent, I think that's when I realized that this is someone that is in my corner. They're coaching me, they're supporting me, they're seeing me. And, and those are some, and, and I, I didn't name names because there are specific women that, and I, you know, I just want to say that they're women and it includes my mom as well, because she has been that one person that continues to say, Rhonda, lead from your heart. And whatever is inside of you, it is going to come out and has been consistent. She's always saying, I'm praying for you. And I'm, I'm going to name her because she is that number one ally that maybe have not supported me in this employment or, you know, what we were saying, but it was one of the voices that I continued to hear. So I'll share that piece for my ally. Thank you. So I guess the only thing I will um, add to that is, you know, for me, when I think of allies and advocates, 
they can, they change throughout, at least for me throughout my lifetime, right? Like they've changed it in the circles that I may be in and may not be in. Sometimes they are women, sometimes they're men, sometimes they're people with titles, maybe an in, in influence and power above me, if you will. And sometimes they're my peers. And sometimes there are folks that maybe have, you know, are in positions in terms of hierarchy, right? That are, are at a lower level, whatever, they can come from anywhere. And I think, you know, when I think of allies and advocates, it's those folks who sometimes come in at the right moment, at the right time, and they're able to just see what it is that you need they're those confidants. And so I am, consider myself exceptionally privileged and lucky that I have so many folks that I can think of. Uh, when I first got into my current leadership role, um, one of my peers and colleagues at the time, right, she knew how excited I was and how scared I was of getting this type of role. And she still continues to be that person that's just like, girl, you got this. I value you. I see you, you know, and, and then there's the folks who maybe are, you know, in higher level positions that say, I think you could do this project, or I want to put you on this, or I want to hear your perspective. Um, and I just want to share those because they do different things, right? And they provide it in different ways. Um, but what I would say that I've learned most from those allies and advocates is how do I continue to be that ally and advocate for others? Because for those who have done those things for me, like there's this saying that, you know, for you to continue to lift as you climb, right? As where people are holding their hands out for us and pulling us up and supporting us and we stand on the shoulders of others, how are we ensuring that we're doing that for others too? And I think that's the the biggest lesson that I've learned from my allies and advocates is I want to be an ally and advocate for those that are looking and needing the exact same things that people have provided for me. So um, that privilege, right, to have those people in our lives, it, it also means we are in a an important position to use our privilege to do the same for others, too. Absolutely. And Sadie, I just want to thank you for being one of those allies for me. Um, years ago. So <laughs> I definitely want to thank you and just uplift what you said about um, as we are all in a phase of development of becoming, we have Michelle Obama here, as we are all becoming and developing, we want to also, just like Sadie said, be that person. Sometimes we think, okay, I'm trying to get myself together, but think about where you've come from and where somebody else is and how you can lift them up and be that, that advocate or that ally for them as you are becoming, because becoming is, is always a, a state of development. Okay. Thank you. Jean? Uh, Sadie, you probably don't remember me, but I remember you thinking about allies and advocates. Um, you came and spoke at Barker Road Middle School when I was, uh, I started the Gay Straight Alliance. I can't remember, 10 years ago. And I think you and I were on a who's who's panel um, that the, the out a lot, formerly out alliance, formerly gay straight alliance um, would do. And I think, I think, so anyhow, I remember you and what Jean, when, you're taking me way back. Those are my I, like trillium health days. <laughs> yes, yes. And that was wonderful. So, so you were an ally, um, you know, as I was being, working to become a better ally for my 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 students um it was wonderful to be able to bring you in and so many others that could show these children you're going to be okay and you need to make a big circle around yourself of, of allies so i call my allies dolphins and um and it comes from the 10 years of counseling where I would sit and I'd see a picture of a dolphin on the table where we, you know, my counselor and I would share. And one day I'm like, what's the dolphin doing there? You know, and, I, and she said, well, when, dolphin, when a dolphin gives birth, all the other dolphins come, because when you're giving birth and you're a dolphin and you're underwater, you can't, you, you can only focus on birthing. So all the other dolphins come and they, they put their back fins to you and they keep you buoyant. So as I went through life gathering people who kept me buoyant, um, buoyant, um, we called we called ourselves the dolphins, and they were all women. And early on, they were all uh, women who looked like me. They were all white women, and 
Then there was my leader, my one empowering leader who was a white male. And he would say yes to everything. I, but I always came in with, here's what we need to do. And here's how we're going to do it. All you have to do is say yes. And, and one of them was let, not letting, but saying, yes, we need to have a gay straight alliance in a middle school. Oh God, the world wasn't going to end. So um, what's really cool is in my later life, um, my dolphins aren't all white. And it's like, I met this party that's been going on, this amazing party that I've been missing out on. And I have, um, I have some new wonderful advocates that I'm, you know, I'm just realizing, oh my God, they're providing this great entree for me into these, um, you know, this leadership, new leadership, new experiences. Um, my other ally, I have to say, my biggest advocate is my gut. And, and for me to be able to listen to my gut, I have to make sure I find time to be still. And, uh, uh, you know, as an older woman here, a more mature woman, um, you know, there's times in your life when you're not still. And it's like you were saying, Erica, you know, I'm, you know, you, you, you try to figure out how many more diapers can you squeeze out of a paycheck? Okay. So maybe, you know, I love, I remember leaving the diaper on a little bit longer because I can save a few bucks. Um, but yeah, my dolphins, my gut and stillness. Okay. Thank you so much, Jean, for that. I, I love that dolphins. <laughs> okay. So we have one last question and we just want to give you guys a quick soundbite as it relates to the advice that you would give here for people that are navigating some of these difficulties that we, we spoke today. So if there's a word or a phrase that you would pass on, um, what would that be? Okay, we can start with Katie. Oh. <laughs> no, go ahead, go ahead. My phrase would be, because it would be self-care, but do not forget to pour into your own cup. Thank you, Rhonda. Sadie? I would say um, you are enough and you're exactly where you need to be right now. Thank you, Sadie. Jean? Bring your full self to the party. Full self, absolutely. Okay, Erica. I would say uh, the number one thing I always say is Ubuntu. I am because we are, we are, therefore I am. We can't do it without each other. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We are all in this together. Um, so we wanna take the opportunity to open the floor up. I know we only have about four minutes, so let's take a minute or two. If there are any questions, from our audience members. We'll take about one or two questions if you guys have any or comments that you guys may have for our guests. Do we have anything in the chat? Okay, so someone says any books that have influenced your journeys? What's that one, Jean? Um, it's by Susan Cain. It's called Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. It, it did change my life and continues. Very nice, thank you. I have to be biased, I'm sorry, but I can't not. <laughs> <laughs> because it's just truth. It's what led me here, um, you know, at, from 12 years old before I ever knew the family existed. So it certainly it was the book, one of the first books I ever bought with my own money for 50 cents. Wow. Thank you. I, I bet it's more than 50 cents now. I think it's a little, <laughs> a little bit more. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So mine, and I think this is still the title. It was a book I read when I was 16 and becoming and finding myself. And it's called I believe, The Game of Life and How to Play It. And it, it's all about 
manifesting, right? And what you believe you bring into like, and so kind of what you put out into the universe, you bring back to yourself. And it became a really good lesson for me to think about my, my self thoughts and what I put in and how I speak to myself and what I think is possible. Um, and it, it definitely has been the root of what I continue to practice into my life today. Okay. Very nice. Very nice. Anything else? Rhonda, do you have any books for us? No. No books right now that, step, that really stick out because the first book that, and usually going with my team would be the Bible. And because I found that oftentimes, even in mental health, there were so many things that I can connect and relate. And I, and I would say that was one of the first books that continued to really impact me to today. Okay, thank you so much. And, and I can definitely agree. There's so many real stories um, for today's time that we can definitely relate to the Bible. Um, Colleen, she just wants to thank all of you guys. You guys were so inspirational. Um, and so many people in our chat have thanked you all for um, the, the great, stories and your input that you shared today. One last question about the future of leadership. How would you guys, you know, um, and, and if one person wants to take this, um, what is the future for female leaders? Maybe I'll answer this question. I'll say the future of female leaders is female, right? <laughs> that is the future of leadership. In the future, there will be no difference between a male leader and a female leader. We will all be leaders and we will definitely have more women in those leadership roles. So again, I want to thank everybody for being here today. I want to thank our participants for joining us. I want to thank my team for putting this together. And I really want to thank our, our, our panelists for taking the time out of your day to share these very intimate stories and, and details with us. I am sure you guys have inspired others. Um, uh, for, for the county, we want to hear your feedback and your thoughts on our cultural committee. So please, in the chat, there is a survey. Please take the time um, to complete that survey. We'll also send it out again if you don't get a chance to um, get it in the chat. But again, we are at our time, so I want to be respectful of that. But ladies, thank you so much. It was so, so powerful. I wish we had another hour. I'm sure we can continue to discuss. But everybody, have a great and wonderful day. Thank you so much for the invitation and so great to hear and learn from all of you thank you same here wellness wednesday everyone i love that wellness wednesday yeah <laughs> wellness women and women take care everyone so many w's right yeah thank you thank you, thank you, ladies. Thank you guys Thank you. And thank you again for the opportunity, Dr. D. Appreciate no, you. Sadie, thanks. I, I'm so happy to see you. I don't I, I don't think I've seen you since the pandemic. So we'll yeah. have to get together. I was excited. We will have to. And congrats on I know I've already told you this, but you know I'm a huge fan and <laughs> congratulations on all that you're doing right now. So oh, absolutely. Likewise, likewise. I'll, I'll send you an invite soon. <laughs> Sounds good. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Have a wonderful thank day. Bye-bye.